What's up everybody, in this video I will be exploring the entirety of From Software's 2015 release Bloodborne and its expansion. This video will have spoilers and a large part of this critique will be about how the Lovecraftian cosmic horror elements shape this experience into what it is. I don't claim to be a master on the lore of Bloodborne and a lot of my takes will be hypothetical from things like how the amygdalas came to be as well as if the Old Hunters expansion was teased in the base game. And before I begin, if you like the video, consider subscribing and sharing it to give my life mean, and hit the bell to be notified of future uploads. Now let's first understand how this game came to be. B. From Software originally created a commercial failure in the form of Demon Souls for Japanese audiences which led to Sony deciding to not pursue the release of that game in Western markets. This led to one of the biggest miscalculations in PlayStation history with Demon Souls releasing in the West to critical and commercial acclaim, birthing the subgenre known as Soulsborne and beginning From Software's ascension into legendary status. FromSoft would go on to make Dark Souls and become a household name in modern gaming. After realizing their colossal misjudgment, Sony would aim to repair this by contracting Hidetaka Miyazaki and his team with creating more experiences for the PlayStation 4 and beyond. This new game would be a spiritual successor to Demon's Souls, integrating the design elements of that initial release but expanding it by creating a new IP instead of a sequel. Miyazaki, the director of this new game, stated he was a fan of the literary works of Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, as well as H.P. Lovecraft, the father of cosmic horror. These concepts like alien beings, dark gothic architecture which was inspired by eras like Victorian London as well as places like the Czech Republic would become the foundation for this new game. The game was designed to have as much detail as possible in its environments and enemies, and this desire to its world was so important that it led to From Software sacrificing 60 FPS for 30 frames, to compensate for the added detail needed in the game as well as the limitations of the PlayStation 4 hardware. I went in blind to Bloodborne and I'm grateful that I did because what awaited me would not only be the best Soulsborne game I have played yet, but one of my favorite games of all time as well. Now that we know how this came to be, let's dive Dive deep into the madness and try to understand what Bloodborne is all about. Get comfortable, this chapter is going to dive deep. The game takes place within the gothic city of Yarnum, a place known for its miraculous supply and distribution of a life-saving practice known as blood ministration. This procedure is highly sought after by people the land over as is said to be capable of curing any illness. You play as an unknown wanderer afflicted with some undisclosed sickness coming to Yarnum to seek treatment. After signing a contract, you fall into a deep sleep only to awaken into a nightmare. Yarnum has become overrun with beasts and you as a hunter are tasked with hunting these monsters in an endless night so you can escape this nightmare and survive. While simple in its premise, Bloodborne's actual story is anything but this. It turns out this blood ministration that cures any illness has a secondary side effect where consuming this blood leads to humans becoming beasts. And these beasts begin to rampage through Yarnum and eventually warriors known as hunters are tasked with hunting these beasts in order to call the madness. Some humans when digesting the blood become something resembling a werewolf, while other humans would become something called vile bloods which are similar in concept to vampires. There are even humans who become bat-like due to this blood showing that wherever this blood came from it isn't native to our world. The blood in question at the root of this bloodborne plague originates beneath the city streets of Yarnum itself. Long ago there was a once proud race of advanced beings known as Tumerians. They are tall with pale white skin and drowned dark eyes, these Tumerians were the first known civilization on earth to come into contact with what is called the Eldritch Truth. This truth was the realization that the citizens of earth were not in fact the most powerful beings to exist but instead there was an outside group beyond anything they could have imagined. These beings were alien in nature, originating from some unknown place between space and time. They were known as the Great Ones and were able to create dimensions of existence where they could influence the minds and events of their victims. One day the human scholars ventured below what would become their great city and came into contact with these Tumerians. As they delved into their depths, the scholars eventually would come upon a great one and realizing humans were not alone in the universe, these scholars would make it their mission to learn everything about these great ones. Not in order to save them, but for their own greed and want of ascension beyond their own evolution. 
the old blood was taken and was found to cure every known human illness. And this old blood would become the catalyst to an era of great innovation and prosperity for not only the city of Yarnum but for humanity. The concept of disease was effectively erased from the minds of humans because of this. But this blood which was originally seen as evolutionary progress would eventually corrupt humanity and begin to regress them into a primal state. The first outbreak of beasts happened in Old Yarnum which became so overrun that the hunters and the church ultimately decided to burn that part of the city down and lock it away so none could enter. But this temporary fix wouldn't be enough and the bee scourge would begin to crawl through Yardom like a cancer and it all happened because of man's want for ascension. There are places in the game like the Upper Cathedral Ward where you can even find an orphanage created by these organizations in order to foster new great ones. These small creatures would be the result of human and alien crossbreeding in hopes of creating a new form of man that would lead humanity into a new age. But this cruelty would result in countless deaths as these hybrid children would either die shortly after birth or sit staring longingly into the night sky in search of their cosmic origins. The entirety of Bloodborne is really about man's cruelty and desire for power. There's even creatures like the One Reborn, which is a massive contorted mess of humans that was created in order to become a being that could ascend into a great one. But I'd also like to talk about the level design of Bloodborne, and what I love about it is that not only is it incredibly interesting to explore, but that FromSoft chose to give the game as much detail as they possibly could. Of course, this did mean the game could only run at 30 frames, which by today's standards is not ideal, which is why Bloodborne needs a remaster on modern consoles and PC as soon as possible. The claustrophobic streets of Yarnum twist like a labyrinth of nightmares. The streets are dirty, covered in ritualistic sacrifices and mobs of crazed citizens frantically fighting to survive. And I love the use of smoke and mist in order to conceal enemies as they jump out like crazed boogeymen. This attention to detail oozes over every aspect, with some rooms looking downright gorgeous in how detailed they are. Take for example Kanehurst Castle. This entire place looks like a modern 3D version of Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Also, outside of maybe the original Dark Souls, I think Bloodborne has the greatest opening level in all of Soulsborne. Central Yarnum is so beautifully realized, it's like the perfect blend of Souls-like design meets gothic horror. From the opening minutes of Yusefka's clinic with the discarded bloody medical equipment to the first opening of the gate into Yarnum proper is unforgettable for me. Not to mention that main street where you go down the steps and see the crazed Yarnumites marching down it towards the burning beasts. It sets the mood of Bloodborne perfectly. You combine this with the main bridge with the two lurking werewolves that leads to cleric beasts and the massive grotesque sewer below, Central Yarnum is from software at its best. Another area I love in general is Yara Ghoul, which is a sprawling mixture of castles and churches, as massive lesser great ones known as amygdalas lurk above like spiders stalking their prey. Can I just say that the design of these amygdalas, which are named after the part of the human brain that processes fear, are some of the most terrifying and incredible monster designs I have ever seen? I have an innate fear of giant spiders, and Bloodborne is full of this imagery. I will say that the overall level design of Bloodborne is probably my personal favorite level layout when it comes to gaming. It's probably because Bloodborne just feels like a modernized 3D version of Castlevania. And in terms of unique gameplay mechanics, this is the first game in Soulsborne to completely throw away the concept of shields, and in my opinion, it's better for it. Gone is the turtle hiding behind my shield tactic of other games, with Bloodborne actively encouraging you to hunt and kill your enemies all the time. Of course, this added level of aggressiveness wouldn't really work without something to compensate it, and that's where my favorite new mechanic is introduced, the Rally mechanic. Rally is such a genius game design idea, I'm surprised other games haven't stolen it yet. Basically, whenever you get hit, you have a window of opportunity to hit the enemy back and restore your lost health by being offensive. This dance of taking hits and taking back your lost health is so damn good I am actually kind of disappointed the rest of Soulsborne doesn't have this mechanic. But none of this matters if you don't have cool stuff to use, which leads us to my favorite weapon system in probably any game ever. And that's the trick weapons. 
The way that Bloodborne at first glance anyway feels like it doesn't have a lot of weapons to choose from compared to other games may seem disappointing at first. But once you start to dig through and really explore what's on offer here, every weapon in the Hunter's arsenal feels both unique and radically different from the others. I love how you have weapons like the Burial Blade, which is this scimitar-like weapon when you wield it, but by clicking L1 it transforms into a freaking Death Scythe. And now it has a totally different moveset that you can alternate between in mid-combo, and it's so cool. There's also weapons like Simon's Bow Blade, which is a sword that can transform into a mid-range bow. Or the Boom Hammer, which is a gigantic smasher that can be ignited, which causes massive area of effect damage. And then of course, there's my personal favorite beast slaying weapon, Ludwig's Holy Blade. This weapon, I'm not kidding, might be my favorite weapon in all of Soulsborne and beyond. It's a straight sword that can slash enemies quickly, and it's great for keeping smaller, faster enemies in their place. But once you hit L1, you sheath your blade, and the sheath itself becomes an extension of the blade, and the weapon turns into a freaking greatsword. You are literally smashing and slashing beasts to death with the sheath of your goddamn sword. Of course you have other cool weapons like the Saw Cleaver, which can go from short quick attacks to a slower but stronger slash, and weird weapons like the Amygdala's Arm, which is this creepy short range axe that can become this weird whip where the arm extends, it's kinda gross. And then there's stuff like the Tonitrus, which can generate electricity around it, making the weapon look like a direct homage to the great Serbian inventor Nikola Tesla and one of his inventions, the Tesla Coil. Not only that, but in place of shields we get something way cooler in the form of guns. These open up your options dramatically with my favorite personally being the Hunter Blunderbuss. It's basically a crude shotgun that allows you to blast foul beasts at point blank range and open them up for visceral attacks. I love this goddamn weapon so much, the fact I can use it to not only stun enemies but bosses is so cool. Like look at Lady Maria here, what should be a super challenging boss fight is made hilariously easy if you know when to shower her in bullets, and these visceral attacks feel so good to perform. I probably sound like a psychopath right now, which I mean yeah, but it's great, I love opening up enemies to bloody visceral attacks. But overall, in my opinion, the access to guns as a weapon over shields is way better and something I actively miss when playing other games. To put it bluntly, Bloodborne is from software firing on all cylinders from its level design to its lore and even its gameplay. It's just the best. I genuinely don't think video games as a medium has topped Bloodborne yet. Sure, there's been other great games since its release, but there's a reason why almost every other day Bloodborne continues to trend on Twitter seven years after its release. But of course I do have issues too. I don't like how you need to return to the Hunter's Dream every time in order to travel somewhere else. Why you can't just teleport from one lantern to another is a questionable game decision. Not only that, but in every other Souls game, you can refresh an area by clicking the bonfire, except in Bloodborne you have to return to the dream to do this, which is not ideal. And while I do enjoy the rune system, I do wish we had accessories instead. Because with accessories like in previous games, you could swap them out on the fly depending on the situation. Yet here, you can't. You have to, yet again, return to home base to swap out stuff and then go out again, which leads to Bloodborne's biggest weakness, especially when it first released, and that's loading screens. Thankfully they did patch this and make it more bearable and my most recent playthrough was on my PS5 so load times were really short, but on the base PS4 model when Bloodborne first released, you were looking at something around 30 to 40 seconds per load, it was kind of insane. And considering this is a Soulsborne, you would die which would lead to a loading screen only to die again and you get the idea. I also wish your clothes were more than just fashion, as it largely doesn't really matter what you wear stat-wise. It really just comes down to how you want to look basically, which is disappointing. I would have enjoyed slotting runes into my clothes for effects to personalize them more, and then replacing the default rune system with an accessory one instead. Transmog would be a welcome addition to these games too, so you could look how you want while having the stats you want too, like Neo by Team Ninja for example, which did exactly this. But besides these issues which a remaster could fix, especially the constant backtracking to the home base for example, it's things that can be fixed or reiterated on in a future sequel. It also rewards your exploration with multiple completely optional areas like Kanehurst or another area that creeps me out way more than it should in the form of the Nightmare Frontier. I am now going to try to explain to you why the Nightmare Frontier is one of the more unsettling levels in modern gaming for me. It's this bizarre, completely missable area where you're transported into this dreamlike dimension where things are just wrong. 
It feels like a barren hellscape where nothing truly lives. The enemies here are also some of the most unsettling the game has to offer from the bizarre beasts and the extremely skin-crawling squid-like creatures. It's this rocky plain that seems to exist in an endless mist of nothingness. It's like walking through your own nightmares, but unlike most dreams, you feel this sort of inescapable dread when being here. The area is covered in poison-like swamps where these alien pale squid creatures slosh around, and besides the spider imagery, the squid-like creatures just make my skin crawl. Near the end of the frontier, you can look down into its misty depths and see what looks like the masts of derelict ships. Strangely enough, once you delve into the DLC of Bloodborne called the Old Hunters, you'll eventually reach a beach where you can fight the Orphan of Kos. And in the distance of this final arena are the very same ships you can see from the frontier. Which makes me wonder if the Nightmare Frontier was in a sense a teaser of what was to come in the Old Hunters. Is the Nightmare Frontier simply a different plane of existence within the Hunter's Nightmare? Am I wrong? Let me know in the comments. It should also be said that water is usually used as a barrier between realities and Bloodborne. After all, when we jump into the depths of the lake from Bergenworth, instead of drowning, you instead fall down into a realm where Rom exists, who's a kin of the Great Ones. And it begins raining spiders because of course it does. Maybe like how Bergenworth's lake is an entry point to Rom and its spiderlings, maybe the Nightmare Frontier is its own plane of existence. And beyond its fog where you see the ships is where Koss and the fishing hamlet is, which is again another plane of existence. Or maybe it's all one world. After all, the entirety of Bloodborne is one giant dream, and in order to access dreams, we have to fall first into a deep sleep. And weirdly enough, when you sleep, your eyes roll to the back of your head and your eyes face towards your brain, so when you sleep, you're looking within yourself. And throughout Bloodborne, we can see various important characters that are all blind. Master Wilhelm of the Bergenworth Academy came to the conclusion that in order for humanity to ascend and peer into new realities, they would need to line their brains with eyes. And the more eyes they had, combined with the loss of primary eyesight, it would force someone to see another way. Characters like Father Gascoigne, for example, is another one of these blind characters, a father and hunter who vow to end the beast scourge, only to consume so much beast blood in his hunt that he would transform into the very things he hated. But why was he blindfolded? Was it to shield his eyes from the murdering of his own wife, or maybe it was to blind himself so he wouldn't witness the horrors that his insight would bring upon him? So in a way, the blindfold is a shield for man against the horrors of the universe. But then it makes me wonder, where did the old blood and the great ones come from? Are they simply aliens from another planet or dimension, or were they perhaps humans in another reality who ascended their own evolution to a point where they became something more? What's also interesting but tragic is that the Great Ones themselves are unable to have children of their own. It's confirmed via the umbilical cord description that says, quote, every Great One loses its child and then yearns for a surrogate. From what has been gathered by the community, the reason why the Great Ones can't conceive on their own is because they have become far too advanced in their own evolution. Maybe the Great Ones are so powerful that they have become immortal and their physiology has been warped and evolved to such a degree that the concept of having children was regressed from their DNA. After all, it's largely accepted that the more advanced a civilization becomes, the less they procreate. So likely the reason why the Great Ones reach out to humanity in the form of women like Ariana as well as the countless hybrid children of the Orphanage is because the Great Ones need other races in order to birth more of their children for them. After all, the entirety of the game's plot is based on ending the nightmare, and as we gain insight and progress, eventually the hunter will reach a place called the Nightmare of Mensis. The theory amongst the community is that the Nightmare of Mensis is a plane of existence where individuals who have tried to contact the Great Ones are brought to. The Mensis Cage is a device that apparently traps the thoughts of the individual wearing it, allowing their consciousness to project itself into the dream so they can make contact. And the Nightmare of Mensis, more so than any other area, feels more abstract and malleable than other locations. After all, there is one single room here where massive spiders reside. And to my knowledge anyway, this is the only room I can think of where these particular spiders exist in. 
why are they only in the Nightmare of Mensis? Were the Great Ones attempting to contact some other spider-like race in another dimension? If this place is an Area 4 communion, then that must be why they're here. After all, like it's been said, the Great Ones need other races to birth their children. And this is just a theory of mine, so of course it could be wrong, but the amygdalas do bear a striking resemblance to spiders. Were the amygdalas lesser great ones that were born via communion with an unknown spider race? Is that why they look so familiar to them? Of course I could be wrong, but there's no way to know for sure, but let me know what you think. After all, when we look at any of the actual great ones in person, they are all in their own way unique. Embryetis, for example, looks like a squid mixed with some sort of bat wing creature, but then the amygdalas look like spiders, and then there's Koss and her orphan, who are the only great ones to my knowledge, that have distinct human-like qualities as well as having actual human-like faces. Could the great ones that are born via a surrogate gain the physical attributes of the race that was used for conception? I think that would be the case and would explain why each great one, while incredibly powerful, are completely different in design, yet they are all, by definition, the same race. But maybe the physical bodies are not what the great ones are in a sense. Maybe what actually defines their collective identity as a singular race has something to do with their minds since they can project and control reality and dreams. After all, from what we know anyway, the supposed leader of these great ones is a being known as Odin. Throughout the game's narrative, we're presented with this concept of a prime great one, but this leader is never shown. Odin is often referred to as the formless one, a great one so powerful that it doesn't even need the cage of flesh in order to exist, unlike other great ones. After all, the chapel in which the various NPCs you meet, like Ariana and Mor, can meet and be safe in is none other than the Odin Chapel. Even the name Odin obviously draws comparisons with that of the Norse mythological Allfather of the same name, although the way it's spelt in Bloodborne is different. But eventually we reach the Lunarium and the source of the nightmare in the form of Murgo. Murgo is an infant great one and the baby of Odin and the Tumerian queen Yarnum, who the city is named after. We see Yarnum in her white dress with a very evident bloody stain on her dress, suggesting that Murgo was forcefully taken from Yarnum by the great ones. Odin likely impregnated Yarnum through the consumption of the old blood, and we can see Yarnum gazing up at the moon in horror when we defeat Rom, who was the veil between the Great Ones and the Hunter. But what's interesting is that once we reach Murgo's crib, Yarnum stands outside of it gazing longingly, wanting to see her child, although she doesn't enter where Murgo is. Maybe there's some sort of power or curse Odin enforced so she couldn't interfere. However, we as the hunter can enter and when we do, I fully expected to see Murgo but instead it's just an empty crib. And in its place emerges Murgo's wet nurse, a creature that has multiple arms like an amygdala but has no face like Odin as if it's formless. This makes me wonder if Murgo is like its father Odin, supremely powerful in terms of the hierarchy of Great Ones. And it also makes me wonder if the wet nurse is a projection made by Murgo in its nightmare in order to fight us. Meaning the wet nurse may not be an actual being, but a scapegoat created by an incredibly powerful infant of a supreme prime god. Then when you kill the wet nurse, normally like other bosses when you defeat them, a text will show like Prey Slaughtered. Yet when the wet nurse dies, nothing shows. It's not until Murgo stops crying that the game eventually brings up the text, Nightmare Slain. So does this mean the wet nurse wasn't an actual great one, but simply a projection of Murgo? We can also hear Murgo giggle after the wet nurse dies. So is Murgo even dead after all, or has it already transcended a need for a physical body like its father Odin and just can't die? I like to think that the existence of Murgo is why all these various great ones are traveling to Yarnum. Like the birth of this infant god is so immense that it drew the attention of various great ones from multiple planes of existence. After all, the Nightmare of Mensis where Murgo resides is a nightmare projection made by Murgo itself and hosted by Mikolash. But unlike Murgo, the Scholars and Mikolash are just human and were likely driven utterly mad by the influence of such a powerful great one. In terms of endings, we can either leave the Nightmare and forget everything, as well as become the next Garamin as we wait for the next hunt. But there's a third ending which is largely accepted to be the true one. 
After obtaining three umbilical cords from various sources, the hunter can consume these and in a twist, a massive great one called the Moon Presence, which turns out to be the being in control of this nightmare, tries to embrace the hunter. But due to the power from the cords, the hunter is able to repel the beast and the true final boss fight begins. It's not a hard fight as the Moon Presence, while dangerous, isn't very powerful, likely due to it never really needing to fight in any previous situation. So we kind of catch this alien off guard and we put it to rest. And this is where the game takes a weird turn, even by Bloodborne standards. Somehow off screen without us seeing it, the hunter ascends their own evolution and is born again as an infant great one. Was it because we killed the moon presence or did Odin witness this and deem the hunter worthy of ascension? Or was it because we witnessed so many horrors and consumed so much blood that the hunter's body evolved and ultimately became a great one? All we know is that in the end, multiple great ones were lost in this dream. Beings like Ebrietis, the Moon Presence, and possibly even Murgo. But in return, the great ones were gifted with a being of insurmountable strength and will who joined their ranks in the end. It also makes me wonder if the Hunter's Dream and the Nightmare Planes and all the other Hunters was just some sort of contest created by the Great Ones to crown the last surviving Hunter the opportunity to evolve beyond their origins. This would mean that whoever was left was the strongest and therefore would benefit the Great Ones tremendously. And in my own crackpot theory, if a Bloodborne 2 ever exists, mark my words that whatever the Hunter became at the end of the first game will definitely be a boss or important figure when a sequel happens someday. Imagine fighting your hunter from the original game as the final boss in a sequel, that would be badass. What would a great one born from the blood of a powerful human hunter be like? Well, it sounds like a crazy boss fight in the making to me. Anyway, we've been talking about lore and themes a lot, so I think it's time to switch it up a bit and start talking about the main attraction of these games, so it's time to talk about bosses. The bosses of Bloodborne are some of the most grotesque and diversified amongst From Software's games. So while I won't talk about every boss, I wanted to highlight my personal favorites as well as some I found really annoying or kind of bad. The first boss I want to talk about is Father Gascoigne, who I think is a really fun and challenging encounter. I love how he's essentially a super version of a hunter and teaches you the basics of how trick weapons and guns can stun and control a fight. What I also love about this fight is that Gascoigne can transform into a beast and at this point begins to hit like a truck. But what's great is that if you meet his daughter prior to this, you can actually use the music box to stun Gascoigne and cause him to hold his head in pain. Thankfully, the fight has a lot of tombstones and trees and just things in general in the way that allow you to create distance and opportunities when it comes to fighting the father. He's an excellent fight, I really don't have much to complain about. He hits a little too hard maybe in his beast form, but I mean, this is a fight all about using the core mechanics to win, so it's great for that. Next up is the big and beautiful Vicar Amelia, who's this fair maiden turned monster who screams so much, I usually have to turn down my volume when I'm fighting her. Amelia can hit like a truck, and can I just say that her hair physics are really impressive? Like, they look amazing. Look how they move. It's so well done. But when you're fighting her, you pretty much always want to be in her face, and a lot of her attacks are manageable. You would think not to stay in front of her, but actually this is where you should be. Because slashing Amelia's hands and face are key to paralyzing her almost constantly. As you can see, I am basically bullying her into a corner with my attacks. I mean, she's a fun fight, don't get me wrong, but is she hard? Nah, but I love her hair. The next boss is one of the only blemishes in this game, and that's the Witches of Hemwick. In my opinion, this is barely even a boss since both the enemies they constantly spawn and the witches themselves are just normal enemies in other areas, but I guess the added mechanic of finding the witches is neat. But it is kind of annoying that they keep summoning these Marvel Blackheart looking dudes and eventually a second witch shows up and you have to kill them both within a certain time period or they respawn with a bit of health back. There's not much to say about them, honestly they don't even feel like bosses and are one of the only weak encounters in Bloodborne. The next boss is the Shadows of Yarnum, who on paper I should hate this boss because it's just three normal enemies that you can later encounter in the Nightmare of Mensis, but within the confines of the fight, the Shadows at least have different weapons and mechanics among them. And having them transition as one of the shadows dies and eventually having the final shadow be able to summon these snake heads out of the ground does keep the fight relatively impactful and moving, even if they are, again, normal enemies eventually, but it's still a fun fight. Then we have Rom, who's both a fight I like and sort of don't. 
Rom's actual attacks are mostly just the typical action RPG boss stuff you're accustomed to. Stuff like big explosions to push you back, or tracking bombs that make you run away so the boss can reposition itself, and more AoE attacks so you can't just spam attack the boss until it dies. The real problem here, both difficulty and visual wise, are the gross spiders that reign above. They hit really hard, but they're also really predictable, and I like how when you hit them in the head, it does very little damage, but their actual bodies are their weak point. It's a solid teaching mechanic that tells the player to attack Rom as they would the spiders while avoiding their rock-solid head. Rom is not a great fight, but is by no means bad either. It's just a gross-ass potato spider with a bunch of weirdos raining from above, but I never really not look forward to fighting Rom at least. What I don't enjoy is this next boss, and that's Mikolash. In my opinion, Mikolash is the worst fight in Bloodborne by far. He's just a normal human enemy that spams two spells over and over, and the real mechanic of his fight is this annoying chase until you corner him. But really, when you look at his attacks, he just does the same moves as the Hunter in Bergenworth before you fight Rom in Mead Wilhelm. And there's BS moments like this one here where I drop into his room and he immediately fires off this Cosmo Blast and kills me before my Hunter can even stand up. And his tentacle attack does obscene damage, but it's pretty avoidable. It's just an annoying fight with frankly lackluster mechanics and a swarm of smaller enemies. They just complicate a fight that is already insufferable to begin with. Mikolash is by far, in my opinion anyway, the worst fight in the game. Then you have Ebrietis, Daughter of the Cosmos, and I don't know about you, but this fight is easy as hell for me. Her moves are really predictable, and even her big FU attack is just a simple jog around until it ends. She's also one of the more satisfying enemies to damage because her big squid head just explodes like a fruit gusher when you smash it. I'll give you this however, she looks cool as hell and she's gross too, but is she hard? Nah. While that fight may be easy, this next one in my opinion is the hardest fight in the base Bloodborne experience and that's Martyr Ligarius. This is one of those fights where things can go south so fast out of nowhere. Ligarius has these annoying blood explosion attacks that can track you and he has this one shotgun blood attack that comes out so fast that for me anyway, it was incredibly hard to dodge or react to. I died quite a few times to him in this run of the game and to make matters worse, he has the long longest path back to his fight from a checkpoint than any other boss, I think. His first form, however, is easily staggered by most attacks, but it's his second form that makes me believe he's the hardest, for me at least. He gains this blood hyper armor and starts rushing you with a scythe while also casting his BS blood spells. Like I said, I died a lot to this phase and eventually my Eureka moment was spamming my shotgun which allowed me to get many visceral attacks and ultimately put Ligarius down. Next we have Murgo's Wet Nurse who I consider to be one of the easier fights in the game. While the nurse does have a rather anxiety ridden phase where it creates copies of itself and rushes you, if you just stay alert and patient and survive this barrage, what's left is a simple boss that you can easily kill no problem. Besides that shadow attack, the nurse is a pushover, and it leaves itself open quite often as well, so it's just not really a hard fight, but it is cool. Then we have the grandpa himself, Garmin the First Hunter, who I gotta say, has the best OST in the entire game and maybe even one of the best OSTs in any game ever for me. This fight is great, it's another fight against an old man in a field which From Software just loves to do I guess, but it's a really fun fight. I think his first phase is more enjoyable, partially because because it's easier to stun him, but once you enter his second phase where he praises the moon, he gains his hyper armor and just starts shrugging off all your attacks. At this point, Garmin is very lethal and very fast, and you mostly need to be patient and get a hit or two in and then just run away. This is the epitome of don't get greedy, because if you do, Garmin will clap your cheeks. Finally, we have the Moon Presence, who is largely a pushover compared to Garmin. The Presence gets stunned really easily, and surprisingly, it doesn't do a whole lot of damage considering it is the final boss, but this is likely because you have to face it immediately after Garmin. So maybe they made it hit a little less because you're probably already hurting for vials and such after the crazy cosmic grandpa, so I get it. One interesting thing I noticed is that the Moon Presence strikes a similar look to one of Lovecraft's characters named Nyrolethetep. In Lovecraft's works, the character of Nyrolethotep is usually depicted as a being capable of shapeshifting. Not only that, but Nyra was also one of the great old ones that enjoyed directly meddling with the affairs of mankind. 
And when you look at various depictions based on Lovecraft's descriptions, the moon presence bears a striking resemblance to Nyarlathotep as well. My theory is that the blood minister who puts you in the nightmare could very well be a shapeshifter version of the moon presence. And once you defeat it, the nightmare ends for real this time. This is just something I wanted to point out, but I think it's safe to say that the moon presence is definitely based on Nyarlathotep. This also makes me believe that Odin, the Prime Great One, might be from Software's version of Azathoth from Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. Azathoth is known as the god of all the other gods in Lovecraft's work, and like Odin, exists outside of any known realities accessible to the ancient alien beings. Other names for Azathoth include the Deep Dark, Lord of All, and the Nuclear Chaos. And while Azathoth does have a physical depiction, even though Odin does not, they both share many similarities. And Nyarlathotep, or the Moon Presence, are children of their powerful fathers. Of course, I could just be drawing conclusions here, but let me know what you think. But all in all, Bloodborne's base game bosses are a nice even collection of great fights with humanoid enemies as well as monstrous beasts and cosmic threats alike. There are still four bosses I want to talk about and they are some of the greatest in the game, so let's begin. The first of these is in the Old Hunters DLC in the form of Ludwig the Accursed. He's the founder of the Healing Church and was the apprentice to Master Wilhelm. Actually, when you beat Amelia, you can place your hand on a skull that looks exactly like Ludwig's and you can learn that Wilhelm pleaded to Ludwig to not use the old blood. But since this is a From Software game, that of course falls on deaf ears. However, Ludwig as a fight is surprisingly difficult. I dare say I actually forgot how challenging Ludwig really was. So much so that I kind of regret not putting him on my recent top 10 hardest bosses list because in this recent playthrough, no boss killed me as much as Ludwig did. He is like the culmination of every crazy mechanic or moveset of any boss in this game, combined into a crazy two-stage epic that is amazing to fight. Look, Ludwig kicked my ass like crazy, but relearning his moves and overcoming him solo, by the way, was extremely satisfying. So yes, Ludwig is hard as hell, yes he should have been on my boss list, but here you go, this is me redeeming myself here, he's crazy strong but amazing to fight as well. Next we have the Living Failures, which are kind of a low point for this expansion. I mean, they're just ads that when they die, the health bar goes lower, which reminds me of the Skeleton Lords from Dark Souls 2, which is never a good thing. But at the same time, their strongest move has them beckoning to the cosmos, and these meteors come down, which are very similar to what Rom summons. But what's cool is that if you look at the big flower in the middle of the arena, it faces a certain way and the way it faces is where the meteors will come from. So as long as you stay on the opposite side of what the flower is, you're fine. And that's really cool, I like that. But in terms of the actual enemies themselves, nah, they're just ads with health bars. Then we have Lady Maria, which a lot of people got mad that she wasn't on my top 10 hardest boss list, but she's not hard for me at all. As you can see in this footage, she took me two tries this run before I just wiped the floor with her. Her weakness is exactly like Martyr Ligarius, and that's your gun. Maria is so easy to stun not only with your weapons, but dude, just shoot her and she just opens up for visceral attacks all the time. Like, it's insane. Even in her second form where she's shooting blood fire slashes, you'd think it'd be hard to manage, but it isn't. Just shotgun blast her and that's it. But after beating her and opening the clock tower, we enter the final area of Bloodborne's story. The fishing hamlet is this drowned, almost forsaken village that looks like it was abandoned by the world outside. The entire DLC were told that there is a secret hiding at the end of the nightmare. Like Murgo, there's something here we're not supposed to know about, and the village paints this picture of oppression. The villagers have become fish-like in appearance and the majority of the town is rotted wood in dark waters. As you travel through, you quickly realize that this place was attacked at some point by an outside force. And at the end of the hamlet, in the inhuman caves within, you find a legion of humanoid creatures in prayer and you emerge into an open beach. And here lies a great one, a being known as Kos, or some say Kossum. Koss, however, is dead, and emerging from her womb is a humanoid creature freshly born out of the rotted body of its mother. This creature is the Orphan of Koss, a great one like Murgo. The Orphan is one of the hardest fights in Bloodborne by far, again, kicking myself that I didn't put it on my boss list, but anyways. The Orphan hits like a truck, and although most of its attacks are quite easy to read, it's two things that make this fight hard for me. One is the use of blood attacks where the Orphan can toss sacks of flesh at you to cause damage, but the biggest reason this boss is hard is the placenta-like axe that the Orphan wields. This grotesque weapon swings around the Orphan and can cause damage from basically any angle you face it from. 
What's concerning is that at the halfway point, the orphan rapidly evolves into an advanced form and the fight goes from hard to yikes fast. Here the Great One can rush you with the evolved Placenta Axe as well as these maddeningly powerful blood bursts that it can fire from above you. Like most bosses, this too is a fight that can go south very quickly. But I did find the second form to be easier to deal with than its first because it opens itself up to more hits and the Placenta Axe can no longer swing behind it like it did before. It is concerning though that this Great One has been alive for mere minutes at this point and already it's able to rapidly evolve its physiology into a more powerful form. It makes me wonder how strong this creature could become if it were left to grow for months or even years. Again, it's not until you kill the actual shadow within cost that the orphan is freed and returns to the ocean of space and time. As for the secret, well, it turns out that the scholars, along with a group of hunters from Maria, Ludwig, and more, entered the fishing hamlet to make contact with Koss, the beached Great One. What ended up happening was the rural village was ransacked by the hunters and scholars, and the villagers were abducted and forced into cruel experiments by the Yarnamites in order to understand Koss and its unique physiology. Koss, however, would die, and the sins these hunters committed upon these people would stay in the village as a secret that would be locked away and kept hidden from the world at large. Littered amongst the caverns, you can see these small white parasites. These originate, to my understanding, from Koss itself. And the small humanoid-like creatures praying before Koss's corpse look similar in ways to the orphan. So the remaining villagers, or maybe they were scholars or hunters, got infected with these parasites from Koss and they were transformed into sickly aquatic creatures. And the organizations of Yarnum worked together to mask their atrocities upon this village. Because the undying need for ascension by any means necessary would lead to the death and torture of countless innocent lives. And in this pain, it's hinted that people like Lady Maria would end her own life for the atrocities she witnessed and caused on the people of the village. But Koss, and to a further extent its child, could not forgive these sins. And so the psychic power of the Great One created this nightmare and trapped the minds of the murderers from Lady Maria to Ludwig, and the nightmare would spread engulfing and pulling in everything around it creating the basis of the old hunter's story and world, a reality born out of blood and curiosity by the hands of men toiling with forces they could never hope to understand. And in a way, when the hunter ends the orphan, the madness can finally end. And like Murgo, the orphan returns to wherever the Great Ones come from. Somewhere in the oceans of time they sleep, whether they will come back one day, no one knows. And that is why the Old Hunter's expansion is amazing. It tells this truly heartbreaking tale of mankind's cruel nature while offering up some of the best fights in all of Soulsborne. And now, let's have some closure. Bloodborne is truly a work of art, from its incredible level design, engrossing lore, and bravery to not shy away from taboo topics, it's these things that make it truly one of my favorite games of all time. It marries the DNA of Soulsborne with that of true existential cosmic horror in such an elegant way that it's almost unbelievable that such a game even exists in the first place if I'm being honest. I know I may sound like I'm just throwing praise at Bloodborne constantly, but seriously, there are a few games that I've played that I genuinely believe to be actual masterpieces. They may have flaws, I mean everything does, but Bloodborne is at its core a monumental achievement in video game design. Really, my only complaints outside of maybe Mikolash being annoying and the whole needing to return to home base thing constantly is that the game really does need a remaster. It needs 60 FPS with 4K upscaling and hell, even ray tracing would be incredible to witness. And I just wanted to say as I get close to ending this critique that this is not only one of my favorite games, but when I compare it to other Soulsborne games, Bloodborne surpasses them all. And I still can't get over the genius masterstroke idea of having werewolves, vampires, and more be the result of cosmic aliens. That is so cool to me. I love Bloodborne, it's a great game, and if you made it this far, thank you for watching, and thanks to my patrons as well. Subscribe for more content like this, and Bloodborne truly is the game of its generation, and one of the best games of all time. An experience that still surpasses anything released since, and it is truly the greatest Soulsborne game ever made. And with that, I bid you farewell, good hunter, and may you find worth in the waking world.